your average Joe Blow out there. Your average Joe Blow out there just isn't pretty too. But uh, let's start. Let's yeah, start on the essay uh, or the short story. So I've been teaching all day. Um, what do you think? Yeah, <laughs> dude. <laughs> I don't know what to think. I. Uh... I, I I really just want to like yell at you and be like, "What the fuck is this shit that I'm reading here?" Like, <laughs> this is the most like fucking cartoonish uh, yes. insanity of uh, insane like nightmare story <laughs> I've ever. Read. It's not even like horror. It's not like real horror. Like, if you found yourself living in this world, of course it would be horrible. Uh, and you would be yeah. screaming to wake up, but um, it's just like everything's just a little off. And the main character is just kind of a, a you, you're like dropped into the mind of this psycho. Like, yeah. I I don't know how else to say it. They they just seem like a psychopath to me. Um, and it's called I mean the story of poetics for bullies. So it's about a bully. I mean you're dropped in the head of a bully. A bully um, and the, the his pathology and the poetry of his pathology, right? And why he does the things that he does. That was he the is. poetry part. The the striking part is when he goes off and he's just in this yeah. like he's spiraling. It is very poetic. Uh, I should have highlighted yeah, some of the moments where that happens, but like I guess towards the end it ha- definitely happens. But um, dude. I wish I were a man, a small boy, a girl in a choir. I'm a coveter. Boston Blackie of the heart, facing the world. Endlessly I covet in case. Do you know what makes me <laughs> cry? The Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. That's there you cool. go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just... That's psycho, dude. But it is like it. Those parts are like really cool. Um, and this guy was hanging out with Amiri Baraka, right? Like he's had to have been. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. That's, That's who I was question. thinking of this whole time. I was thinking of that uh, the black heart. And it kind of felt like it was just kind of going off the rails, like you know, like a, there's certain um, things you read and they just read like machine gun fire, and I think that's yeah. like a whole in my head. That's like a whole genre of like writing, and sometimes I feel like I want to write like that too. Sometimes, um, but it's just, you know, it's just like very associative, uh, full of energy. A lot of I don't give a fuck in the writing. Um, yeah, I mean it's, it's just it's wild, man. It's it, fucking wild. Amari Baraka used to say that one of the things he hated was that he could only write with his fingertips. He wanted to write with his whole body and every muscle, you know, as he, as he's going off. And you could definitely yeah put that in this writing and, and in black art as well. It's just like you know, I'm tired of I'm tired of holding back. I'm try, I'm tired of restraints. I'm tired of uh tired of consideration of tired it's almost there's like you said once again very little plot you know very i mean there's just there's several beats that the story goes through he meets john williams um he sees the effect that john so john is a stranger comes to town um he's a backdrop of the story push is the neighborhood bully he's really like the school bully but he's not um a super violent, uh, ultra-like criminal or anything. He's more of like a prankster almost. But he's a really malicious prankster. He, mm-hmm. he does he does enjoy sadism. You know, he does enjoy making people cry. Um, yeah, that that's shown in the like really shown with the water <laughs> making yes. Eugene. Like, he's like forcing you. He's just like I don't want to. This is when John Williams is being introduced by Eugene. He's like, oh, this guy. I want to tell you about this guy. You got to get him. Yeah. And he's like, Eugene, it's almost like, like, is like Eugene. his little Cody. And, and yeah. Even that, even as like Cody. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I just think he's like, like Eugene's trying to like help him bully this new kid in a way. Yeah. <laughs> while, while getting bullied mercilessly. Yep. Uh, Eugene's like this little Toady, but he's even like the reason that Push, the name of the bully, can't um, form a gang is because he can't stop bullying. He has to bully everybody around him, except for girls, but 
Uh, that's an aside. There are no girls in the story. It's a very male centric story again. Um, yes. And Eugene has come to introduce Push to John Williams, who's at the uh, baseball field and the dugouts, I believe, telling a story of life in India. And uh, how old are these kids, by the way? Because John Williams is like, uh, he's well, like John a Williams timeless is- spirit. <laughs> yeah. He's fifteen, but he's also like fifty or seventy. He talks yeah. like he talks like a fucking English professor, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's so this is an interesting aside, but you're very right when you say that the world that Stanley Elkins has created is cartoonish. Everything is like um, magnified. In, in especially in color, colors are extremely bright and vibrant. Characters are extremely like they're whatever they are, they're that to the extreme. Like Eugene is a toady, but he's just like the the biggest wimp, wimpiest toady you've ever seen. He's bullied by Push every second. Um, hey, hang on a second. What are you what are you talking about, toady? What is that? So toady is like, um. It's almost like you're somebody's gimp, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I could, that's basically what he is. It's it's like you're you're not on equal footing. It's almost like you're somebody's like henchman or something, or you're their gopher. You're the you're the guy that like does the busy work. Like I was I was the toady of the strip club back in the day, <laughs> you know. Like the strip club as an entity itself, they'd send me to go around and do all the bitch work. And come back for the for the picayunes, as the Italians right. would say. Um, you know, you're you're you see some friendships like this. Uh, George in, or I'm sorry, not George, but Lenny is a toady of George and of my right. son. You yeah, know, yeah. Um, it's it's definitely a one sided relationship, and it's not always malicious like this, but this one definitely is. Um, and in fact, he ceases to become uh, Push's toady, actually, as the story goes on. It's one of the one of the um, changes that happens throughout the piece is that the, the world moves away from Push. <laughs> Which is <laughs> funny, because you'd think that would be what he wants. He wants people to be get away from him, but it's, it's see, Push is such a complex character. He doesn't want the world to be away from him. He wants the world to love him for being what he is, which is a bully. To remind, and he thinks of what he does as a kind of charity because everybody else in the world ignores all the losers and the gimps and the freaks and you know the ugly and the stupid and the, and the sad and the you know anybody that anybody that society ostracizes. He feels like he's been um, gifted to pay attention to him. You know, to, to give them heed. And this guy, John Williams, comes around, and he's the opposite. He's he's going to rectify all of their, mis- you know, all of nature's mistakes. Right, he's well, they had the to... same, in, in your reading of it, they had the same aim, but one's good, one's evil, you know? <laughs> one's there right. to pay them mind by torturing them. The other one's there to make them better. Yes. And I mean, we can see that's an, another interesting debate. Is is push evil? Is push evil? And is evil a part of nature? You know, because um, he definitely. I don't think people see themselves as evil. I don't think he does. Um, right. You know, not until the end. I think. I think that he sees himself as a kind of. A kind of patronage and a kind of calling to a certain uh, viewpoint of life and to a certain aspect of life. You know, Mother Teresa used to say um, that the suffering of people brought them closer to God. You know that? Um, mm. And 
you hear a lot of rhetoric like that. By the way, it's, a, it's very much a story that's obsessed with uh, religion. God. Get these um, this, great women. This story or, or, or. This uh, story. Right. This story. I mean, for Christ's sake, what does he say to John Williams? Is John Williams is beating his ass? He goes, "Where's your other cheek? Where's your two cheeks?" And John Williams tells him, "There's only one cheek for tyrants." He convinces to beating his fucking ass in front of everyone. Um, right. Oh, it's also a great story for talking about um, humiliation. So push. Goes around humiliating everybody all the time. And he finally gets his comeuppance. He gets his just desserts, which is that he's humiliated in front of everyone. Um, by his own design, by the way. He knows that uh, John Williams is stronger than him. He thinks that the only way to beat John Williams is to um, is to deny him his pushes ascension away from being a bully. And you kind of think that that's where the story's going, right? As you're reading it along, John Williams <laughs> is going to fix this kid, man. John Williams is going to make this Almost. kid seem like... <laughs> I, 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 yeah, like, that's kind of... <laughs> I don't know, man. Not that, I don't know. The way the story's written <laughs> and it was suggested by you, I was like, there's no happy ending here. <laughs> it ain't going to happen, uh, man. But yeah, I get what you're saying. Like, I feel like the story wants you to think that, you know, because Williams is kind of happy, like uh, not happy. He's um likable, you know. He's like, like, oh, maybe he is. Maybe he's the salvation for speaking of like biblical yeah. terms. Maybe he's well, just, he uh, push of salvation. Yeah, he's salvation for everyone else, but push denies that. Um. By the way, another um theological illusion when right before the fight Bush is like skipping people in line and you know they've ceased to uh, be afraid of him and they've ceased to fight with him they've ceased to be angry at him and in fact they make room for him in the line this is uh, prior to the fight and somebody's like oh Bush you forgot your silver <laughs> you know um, there's just there's just literary illusions all over the place about um about God and about their purpose on the planet. Yeah. So what's he um, saying? Like, what's the writer uh, Elkin saying? Like, why? Why does he bring all this in? Well, I don't know. I've never, like, I've never really paid much heed to what authors say about specific pieces of their work. I'm more interested in, like, and I haven't read. I've read a couple stories by Elkins. I think this one's the best. Uh, I don't know. I, don't, I haven't really read much of what he said about his own work. I know that, um. Some of it's really acclaimed, but it all kind of like there's also something missing from this piece, you know. <laughs> like once again, we're not guys like me and you, uh, very moved by um, <laughs> matters of the heart, and right, you know, we're of the Lee Young Lee school and the Raymond Carver school and Ron Carlson school. Yeah, it's funny. Stuff. It's kind of funny you mentioned Lee Young Lee because right before you sent me that text the other day to read this story, I was like, hey, you know, I was thinking about Mary. You're talking about Mary a little bit since you had went to her uh, memorial and everything. I was like, shit. Well, you know who got a, who gave us Lee Young Lee or showed us Lee Young Lee? Yeah, um, it was Mary. Yeah. yeah, it was Mary. So I was thinking about Lee Young Lee. Talk about the complete opposite, <laughs> dude. <laughs> Uh, what is missing in this? Like, what could what could he possibly have done to this story to like bring the uh, you know a moment like that uh, of the heart in? I don't know, dude. <laughs> it yeah, would have diminished I mean, it, the story probably if he tried right, to do something like that. It would have felt heavy handed, and it would have felt like um, somebody was imposing on the dream. You know, this is like you said; it's, it couldn't have been written any other way than the way I think. The ending was perfect. I just think that some art is always going to be stifled by, um, by the artist himself. And in this case, it's just such a hyper focus on verbosity of the, of the main character and of the narrative. And 
the humor. I mean, it is a funny piece. It's a piece that you read and you kind of laugh. And you're kind of like, ah, oh, push you, you old dumb rascal. You know? <laughs> um, I definitely did laugh a few times. I didn't think that <laughs> exactly. Um, oh, push you old bastard, you. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, it's just so ridiculous, you know? I think yes. that's what it is. It's like, gosh, she just keeps going, you know? This... The story's like just dumping a bucket of water onto the concrete. It just fucking falls out, you know, and it yeah. goes everywhere. It's great. It's yeah. like there's no rhyme. When you talk about, you mentioned like it's like a um, like a dream. Like when you talk about like writing as if you're it was a dream. This is it right here. <laughs> this feels like a yeah. little dream, um, or it just feels like a dream, you know, like a. I said nightmare earlier, and it's not exactly a nightmare, but it is kind of like, like I don't know, it's there's something about it that's kind of like a little like off and like feels yeah. like a, you know, like when you're like kind of like a lucid dream and you kind of start realizing you're dreaming and like everything's a little fucking off in this story. Yeah, um, it's, it's very that's surreal. Makes, yeah, surreal kind yeah. of and like, and like go back to like saying it's cartoony. Um, it's also, Eugene like, and John Williams have like normal names, but everybody else it's called like Claude and um, Blood. Push, yeah. Know, push. Um, it's just like everything, everything just it. There is a character named Clob. There is a character named Slud. There's a character named Memmer. There's a character named Frank. Um, also, right. And like, you got John Williams. <laughs> yeah. John Williams and Push and Eugene. And so there is actually a cast of characters in this story, but most of them only have like one or two lines of dialogue. And it's mostly just Bush, Eugene, and uh, and John Williams. John Williams delivers everything that John Williams says for the most part is this big rousing speech. You know, very um, like I said, is it's like a English teacher just going off on a giant tangent. He actually didn't sound like an English teacher. He sounds like a a history teacher, an anthropology teacher. Yeah, you know, yeah, going, more like it, yeah. Going on and on about the differences between the 8th century and feudal Japan and, you know, the 9th century over here and different customs in different parts of the world. He's this very worldly guy. Um, right, he has to name the match, you know. He's like a very adult name, <laughs> you know, first and last name. Uh, yeah. I don't think anybody else has their first and last names. I mean, really, like, really, that's that's kind of the point, though, isn't it? It's here's adulthood looming on on the horizon. It's probably one of the other things that bullies fear. I think ultimately is, you know, when when they move out of grade school and into the real world, like bullies aren't tolerated for the most part. You know, um, they're kind of relegated mostly to like. To prisons or to shit jobs, um, yeah, they, they can't dominate in that capacity anymore. And uh, I, I do think it's one of the things that push fears. He also fears. Um, I, I think he just fears everything. He fears himself. He fears. There's also a piece that's just you know, it's, there's so much psychology at work and underneath. You know, all of this anger and rage is, is just so much fear. And it's all on the page. Um, yeah. And he's really insecure about uh, his poetry, I think. I think he's insecure about his feelings about the world and human connection. Like, really, where is he at his most, where is he at his most fearful is when John Williams comes to his house and goes, um... Uh, let's see. So let's be he goes, to John, he goes to John Williams' house the first time, and they have a little chat, uh, and it's gorgeous. And then John Williams comes to his house, and he goes, "Please let me in. Uh, we ought to be friends." Push. All right, this, all right, shit, went too far. All right, right, right above that. Um, a week ago, John Williams came to my house to see me. I wouldn't let him in. Please open the door, Push. I'd like to chat with you. Will you open the door, Push? I think we ought to talk. I think I can help you to be happier. You know, this is when Push is, that is, is most afraid. I don't want to be happier. Go away. I was. It was what little kids used to say to me. 
Please let me help you. Please let me. I begin to act you. Please let me alone. We gotta be friends, Push. No deals. I am choking. I am close to tears. What can I do? What? I want to kill him. I double locked the door and retreat to my room. He is still out there. I have tried to live my life so I could keep always the lamb from the door. He has gone too far this time, I think, sadly. I will have to fight him. I don't know, man. It's just... It's such a important weird. part of the story. Yeah. It's like, what, what sets him off to decide to humiliate himself in front of everyone um, is the offer of friendship. You know? And friendship on equal terms. I mean, true friendship, not what Eugene offers him, which is... Um, total dominance, but uh, human connection. And so we're back yeah. to, we're once again back to uh, Dennis Johnson, two men, you know, and uh, people's fear of that, people's fear of human connection. Yeah, this is like the uh, the precursor, you know, the, the back story <laughs> of that guy. Yeah, of that same guy. Yeah. Um, that's a great point. You know, is that because Push couldn't be a bully in the real world? Anyways, he, you know, he's probably going to cope with his lack of uh, of on self knowledge and self determination and self will. He's probably going to cope with his own inadequacies by turning to drugs and by petty crimes. You know, and and there you right. are, two men. There you are with with he's going to have more toadies, which is what those other characters were to the narrator of two men. And, you know, maybe he'll commit a dumb, violent act or maybe he won't, you know, but he's going to live that the life of a wretch, basically. Um, and that's the life that he's determined to live. And, you know, some people, some people are un, unreachable. <laughs> Unfortunately, some people are unreachable. Like this was the moment. This was the moment when um, the narrator of Cathedral meets Robert or Bob. Bob meets Bob, right? And yeah. instead of instead of them drawing the cathedral and having this holy moment, uh, you know, he excuses himself to the other room and goes to sleep. You know, when you miss that moment or when you reject that moment, what becomes of your life? Um, I think that's the, di like, that's the difference between, you know, a story kind of, like, taking, we talked about this with the Philip Roth story, like, the story kind of just takes the right turn at every point, versus a story that's still, like, this one, you know, it takes kind of the opposite turn. It's still technically the right turn because, like, any other imposition on this story's, like, trajectory is, you know, going to feel, like you said, forced or disingenuous. Um, given the yeah. characters and the situation and just, like, how it's written and everything. So, it's almost... I don't know. It's It's definitely unfair to compare it to, you know... It's unfair to the compare best, it in greatness to the best short yeah. story ever written, or like yeah. one of them, anyway. Um, well, it, I, it's only natural, you know? Like, what makes that story... Th the question that I have when you're talking about Cathedral is, like, what makes that story, like, just kind of, like, jack your shit? It's like getting punched in the face with a love or something. I don't know how to describe it. It's like, there's just something about it that, like, gives you hope and, like, makes you feel good good about the world you know um obviously it's about different type of person you know uh even though it's still a, technically about a bastard an asshole or whatever um it's yeah, a person who's capable of like transcending it i guess and that's the, yeah. maybe that's the only difference besides yes. you know everything else that makes the story different great so, so the, what, what makes one story so great and the other one the other one good and and fun is the author itself. I mean, I think Raymond Carver just had that kind of heart that, you know, I feel like, you know, if we'd known him, 
we hung out with him at the bar, he would be able to do that. He'd be able to tell us stories about his family and about his friends that just break you right. as a human being, make you, you know, make you understand the greatness that it is to be alive. And I feel like if you hung out with Stanley Alkins, you know, you'd chuckle a little bit, you know, and <laughs> you'd be probably be probably be amazed at his verbosity, but he's not. I don't think that he was somebody that was going to change your heart. You know, he's he's somebody. He's more of a performer than um, than like a Van Gogh or or whatever have you. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, man. I mean, um, a performer, huh? That's yeah, I think he's more of a it. performer. I mean, the whole piece is a performance. You could read this, by the way, in front of a class. And they pay attention to you because the language is so... Sh- I mean, here, you want to talk about surprising language? Here's some surprising language, you know? So I think this is what a lot of those professors are so enamored with, um, you know, in, in universities when they talk about surprising language because everything that Push says sounds like it's poetry. But it also kind of, kind of sounds try-hardy a little bit, you know, and it sounds like... It's like, yeah. I don't know. I've never met anybody like Push, per se. You know, uh, certainly never, but nobody, I, mean, I guess the the, pro, the closest person to him is me, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> it kind of <laughs> reminds me of what it's like to write uh, when you're, you know, 25 or something, or 22. I don't yeah. know. Like, you kind of, like, are just trying to show the world something. Like, there's something here, guys. Look at me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, try hardy, yeah. I guess, is the way it is. To put yeah, you're it. trying to be shocking, you know. You're trying to be shocking, and you're trying to, you're trying to get attention. And um, those are definitely important things when you're young. You're trying to get noticed. But uh, yeah, you're right. Raymond Carver wrote uh, Cathedral. I think it was either in his 40s or 50s. And um, and he just, you know, he was he was just a different kind of person. Uh, by the way, it's based off of a real story. Cathedral um, really did. He really did meet a blind guy named, I guess, the blind guy. Him really did have some. He really was this beautiful soul that changed just, the way Raymond Carver looked at the world. I don't know if they actually drew cathedrals or anything, but um, but Raymond Carver yeah, probably also looked yeah. at himself like a kind of a doofus, you know. And kind of insecure about his relationship and insecure about his, his uh, marriage and probably felt like the jobs that he was doing performing at the time were uh, useless. He probably felt useless himself. I mean, you know, tell me as a writer, you don't feel useless. Everyone's <laughs> I mean, dude, like, that's like half of what being a writer is. You know, yeah. you sit down and you're like, what happened? Where did it go? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, like, where the fuck did it go? Like, like, what is the point of all this? What is the point of me? What the fuck did I do with my life? <laughs> you know, I could have official. Yeah. Like, oh, fuck. Um. <laughs> hey, the fishermen want to be artists, and the artists want to be fishermen. I actually, you know, it's funny. <laughs> I've I've met um the other like a couple weeks ago, man. My childhood friend. Like he used to live in my old neighborhood. I was coming through Asheville and I don't, I haven't seen this guy in like five years, six years. And before that, I hadn't seen him in like 15. And, um, he's, he's, uh, his dad was a, a fisherman, but down in Florida, he, he was a captain of the sea mist. If you know what that is, but anyway, he's talking to me, So he's, he's been up in Alaska fishing and shit. He was down in Florida fishing you know, start trying to start a business and everything. He's like, all I really want to do is write stories. <laughs> Fucking hilarious. <laughs> uh, I don't just like do it, man. <laughs> I go out to the lake. <laughs> yeah. we'll compare notes. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, you, you get a story. I mean, you, what else? What What else do you say besides just go ahead and do it? But like, the t- reality is, to do it, you have to like kind of you have to reorient your life. You know, it's kind of like that Bukowski yeah. quote, you know, you have to go f- for it with everything you have. Um, 
and it's hard, man. It's just hard to keep it up and, you know, keep it going. And like we've talked about, ad nauseum is doing it over and over and over again. Um, it's kind of what it's all about. But what it's really, it's, and I'm, see, I, I think we, you were kind of teaching me a little bit, I think, throughout these podcasts about what it really is. What it's really about is not like producing a good thing over and over and over again. For what reason, right? That's the ultimate question. The reason you do it is to live the life because it makes you happy <laughs> to do <Yeah>. that. <laughs> and right. it makes you feel good. Like you're adding something to the world that's bigger than yourself. And, you know, not to get too, you know, stupid with it, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's really about just let's keep it purely selfish here. It's, if, it's because it feels good to do it well. Um, and it feels it's just it's greater than the product itself, which is hard to explain. You know what I mean? Like even if I, I actually wrote a poem after I I, I uh, met with my friend because we we're talking about this story about my dad getting. I've told you this story probably, but my dad getting um. Somebody said he had a. It was back in the old neighborhood. Somebody said he had a gun and SWAT came to the cul-de-sac and lined the cul-de-sac. And they dragged him out of the house and beat him. And I was like, oh, shit, I forgot you were there. Like, this kid was there with me. We were literally just walking to, to our house or to my house to get, like, a fucking video game or something. And we see this scene. And I was like, man. And so I wrote this. So I wrote that poem. And I, I haven't shared it with anybody. But and this kind of goes to my point. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I wrote that poem be- as a way to like connect with my old friend. You know, that's all that really mattered about the poem. Yeah. Um, whether it's good or not is who gives a fuck. You know, it, it made me feel good for a few days knowing I had written it and that it yeah. matters to somebody that I might have written it. Um, yeah. You wrote another so, poem for uh, Leo's sister on her birthday. I mean, I love that poem. Um, I think, and she loved it too. I recall, you know, I mean, it's they're they're also like a commodity, it's to an extent. It's a part of your soul, but it's also a commodity, and it's just they're just supposed to be fun. It really is just that simple, John. You know, you're trying to do it for all these lofty reasons, but ultimately, it's just supposed to be fun. And yeah, I, I feel like that's why every everybody who created anything worth a damn did it is because it was fun to do it. You know, and everything that's ever been worth a damn was fun to create. You know, I think that uh, I think that in spite of the many, many problems that existed behind the scenes, the Godfather, as far as casting, budget, and this problem and that problem, I think that they were all having fun when they were making this fucking movie. I know Marlon Brando was. Marlon Brando had the Colum- the Colombo family, or some some high ranking member of the Colombo family, brought his family on sets. For the first scene when uh, his daughter is getting married, and it's not in the movie, obviously, but Marlon Brando during one scene, like one particular scene, was apparently like mooning people in the audience, <laughs> <laughs> you know, while it's going on. And one of the like one of those people were like actual mob members, you know. I mean, it's it's just like that's it's what. And it's, by the way, it's one of the reasons they insisted Marlon Brando be in that movie, but. Um, but that's, I don't know, it's the only constant that I've seen in, in great art is that when Jimi Hendrix is up on stage and he's performing the Star Spangled Banner, he's going nuts on it, um, this fucking sounds like he's having fun. And that's really what art is at the end of the day. It's just fun distilled to whatever medium, um, it's adhered to whether it be music or paintings or yeah um fun is just such a weird way to put it because it's like of course it's fun like but it's the weirdest fun in the world because it's like fun that feels important you know yeah um I don't know, minor, like, I don't know. It's kind of like fun when you go see a movie and you can talk about it, you know? Like, that's, it's like, brings you closer to the world, I guess, is a way to put it. Like, it's fun that, like, feels not not wasted, you know? Like, it's not wasted time. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not, not arbitrary. People, it's I think not a you bunch of people uh, playing, like, with the fire dancing or anything. It's fun that lasts. It's also fun that lasts for a long time. 
Yeah, it's um, like you can revisit it and like get a, a whiff of that <laughs> again. But it's, but so much of art is about those moments, you know. You'll never you'll never be that kid who walking home with his friend, seeing his dad rested, you know, seeing his dad at the lowest point in his life, or what you thought anyway. It's probably one of the most more traumatic points in your life. You'll never be that kid again, and nobody will know what what that kid was going through. Or what that kid said to his friend while that was happening, or what he said to the cops, or if he said anything, or if he just froze, like that, that'll just be gone unless you write about it, you know. Um, right. That's that's part of the reason. That's the other part of the reason you do it is is to make something that lasts. So it's fun that lasts. It's distilled fun that hopefully lasts. If anything lasts, eventually nothing lasts. That's another thing that you, you contend with. That's another thing I think, by the way, push fucking, you know, is is fighting against is um he's angry with the world, not just because people are limited and flawed, but also because nothing lasts. Because all men aren't created equal. You know. Um I don't know. It's just there's so much pain underneath yeah is there, so in spite of it feeling like a cartoon there is there is actually some depth to uh the concepts even if there isn't much depth to a lot of the characters um so I, yeah I, so I, fucking I fun yeah it is it is pretty fun i guess it's fun to be able to like read something and like get, get entrenched in a story and just be able to detach after a few minutes of reading it you know and like it, I don't know. It's like, it's, um, I guess, you know, it's the fucking draw of fiction to begin with, to be able to like escape a little bit into this weird little story for a while. Um, yeah. It's not life changing though, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you want that, you got to turn to the Carvers and the Hemingways and the Thomas Wolfe's and. Alice Munro's. See, Alice Munro's the exact opposite of this. <laughs> At some point, we have to talk about her, John. We have to talk about her because. Oh, uh, I think I, I think I love Alice Munro now. I just didn't like. Alice Monroe when we were at Chris's house and I was trying to read a story while drinking 14 beers uh, yeah. that I had to talk about the next morning at nine o'clock. <laughs> That's yeah. what I didn't like. Alice Monroe. Alice, Monroe. Alice Monroe is not the person you you read when you got a couple beers and you very. Yeah. Very subtle. See the exact opposite of Stanley Elkins. Alice Monroe, all plots, all very subtle clues as to what's going on, all very subtle sexuality. Um, a lot of things are happening off the page, but in- influencing you know, scenes that are on the page. And so you have to sit back and think about, well, what, what happened between these characters, between these scenes? You know, and and what's not being stated? What's only what's see? She's also of the of the school where everything's shown and nothing's told, and right. you have to sit back and ponder a lot of her shit. But does she have a story um, that's not like forty pages long? Uh, probably the shortest that I've seen of hers is the one that you hated, which is. Uh, the first time I saw an airplane, right? <laughs> Wasn't that what it was called? Um, and I don't remember. I don't. I don't remember either. But I'll look up some of her stuff. Uh, yeah, maybe we one, we should talk about her soon. Podcast. But there you go. I mean, there's there's the exact opposite. There's somebody who uh, characters aren't super verbose and super comical and super off the page, and, you know, and things aren't happening in this. You know, extreme manner. I mean, if you were to comp- compare this to music, A Poetics for Bullies is like ICP or like Limp Biscuit, you know, or like hard rap. Fucking, right. You know, everything, like, everything's just being screamed at you like fucking Rage Against the Machine or something. Whereas Alice Monroe, very soft, very delicate um, language, events. And, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, you know, I, I think both both are equally good, honestly. Um, you know, it just depends on depends on what you like. For me, um, I don't know. I guess I still have some of my wild 
recklessness <laughs> from, uh, from being in my 20s. Especially as I get older and I get softer and pudgier and, you know, my life becomes more structured. You need, need something to remind you yeah. <laughs> of who I used to be. <laughs> I mean, listen, a lot, of, a lot of great fiction just on that subject alone. You know, um, uh, please be quiet, please. And it isn't just about an affair. It's about a guy trying to re- refine his past. You know, Babylon Revisited, guy who's lost everything trying to get everything back including his past and that's the fatal flaw of, of that um, character so mm. uh, but something to think about is as we slowly become adults I'm 30 fucking 5 years old I'm like 2 weeks and still slowly becoming an adult <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah you know. I feel that I feel that but it's all good man. anyways all right well all right. Shit. Um, so what do you want to do next, ne- uh, next time? Well, shit, I am actually going to be uh, away like the whole week from Wednesday on. Um, You want to just skip a week? Yeah, we'll skip a week. We have a Let's... week. Yeah, we, we got have... a few. We got a few things. Long, like out the ass. So I think we'll be fine. But uh, and we'll figure out we'll figure out what to do from there. But we'll definitely yeah. keep it going. I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah, me too. Right. Just a little like off today, man. To be honest, but uh, obviously I didn't read the story more than a couple or more than once. So you know, I like to re- I like to. That's why partially why I like to read shorter stories because I like to kind of get into it. Um, like with poetry, you know, you know, get into like the language of it. Maybe and, we'll uh, do weekends. We can talk about we did it. <laughs> we did it. Would be cool. Yeah, that is cool. I almost read that in relation to one of our early stories uh, that we talked about. I think it was Father's Story. I don't know. Maybe that was the one. For some reason, maybe. I was thinking of that, dude. I don't know, man. That story is. Uh, I remember it being really good. So, dude, it's so fucking good, man. So good. Let's do it so, right back. Yeah, let's do it, dude. All right, man. All right. Easy, all right. All right, you too. Take care, dude.